Coming up, a look at America from abroad. Unlike European countries that really focus on America's values, Asian countries are focusing on America's hard power, America's military power. What that means is they look at the pivot and they say, where's the pivot? Chatham House's Xenia Wicket discusses the European and Asian perspective of U.S. politics, business, and values. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Xenia is the director of the U.S. program uh, and acting dean of the Academy of Leadership and in International Affairs at Chatham House, the foremost think tank in the United Kingdom. Before that, she was executive director for the Peace Nexus Foundation in Switzerland. She was a foreign affairs officer in the Bureau of South Asia, U.S. State Department, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the qualifications are too long to read. Jenny, you've done it all, and now welcome to the Carnegie Council. I haven't done this yet. You haven't done this yet, but you are about to. I'm glad to say. Well, it's 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 timely that Xenia should be here because uh, Chatham has just produced a few months ago a report on elite perceptions of the U.S. in Europe and Asia. Let me begin, Zinni, by asking you about the, the structure and the, the parameters of, of the study itself. Um, I, I was interested that you chose essays instead of interviews uh, from uh, participants. How many were there? How geographically widespread was this? Who was chosen from what disciplines? What, what, were, the, what were the... So we spent probably six to eight months trying to figure out what we should do when we debated whether we should do interviews, whether we should do questions and answers, structured questions, essays, how we should go about this. And of course, as we all know, there's vast numbers of polling publicly, you know, general public polling about how people see the United States, whether it's by German Marshall Fund, whether it's by Pew. And what we were trying to do is, is grasp something different. We were trying to grasp, A, what elites thought, rather than what the general public thought. And we wanted to get beyond what the general public polling was. So the general public polling tells you people like America more or they like America less. What, what they don't tell you is why do they like America more or like America less. They don't tell you how do we make those decisions. Is it because we like the president? Is it because we like the policies? Is it because we like the local policies? So we tried to do something different. Essentially, we said, we want to reach out to people in what was originally six countries in Asia, six countries in, in Europe, but ended up being seven countries in Europe. And we wanted to talk to people in four sectors. So we looked at the public sector, or the former public sector, the private sector. We looked at media, and we looked at think tanks and academia. And in each of those sectors, we reached out to anywhere from between four and 15 people in each of those sectors, four sectors, in each of those countries. And we said to them, we don't want you to tell us what the polling in your country says. We don't want you to tell us what the general public says. We want you to tell us what you think. We want personal statements from the heart. What do you think about the United States? And why do you think those things? Uh, do you like America? Do you not like America? Do you like America's policies? Do you not like America's policies? And instead of giving them structured questions, we essentially gave them a paragraph up front, saying, what do you think and why? Is it because you're looking at the president and your views of the president? Is it because you're looking at America's policy? Is it America's culture? So we tried to grasp personal statements because we really wanted to get this idea of what's going on inside rather than what are the numbers telling us. And to varying degrees, we succeeded. Um, if you look at the report itself, there are some incredibly powerful statements. Um, one that I like to talk about, uh, one Greek individual sent us photos. Sent us photos of the US Embassy back in the 60s and sent us photos of the US Embassy today. And said, I remember driving past the Embassy when I was a child and it was this open green space. It was this welcoming environment. And you drive past it now and you've got barriers and you've got policemen. And that says it all. So I mean, this was the kind of thing, so incredibly powerful statements. Unfortunately, of course, they were done confidentially. So all we have in the report is little snippets um, that we think are particularly powerful that say it far better than I could. Mm -hmm. One of the things that comes across in the report are distinct differences between perceptions in, in Europe and Asia. And let's focus on Europe for a moment. There was a basket of responses that are of particular interest to us as the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs that spoke about 
the issues of moral leadership, mm -hmm. um, the decline of U.S. values, a dichotomy between U.S. words and deeds, diminishing U.S. influence. I don't know if that makes a sense of a new isolationism. Speak to that a little bit about that particular strand of response that seemed to pervade some European answer. It was fascinating. Let me start, if I will, with the kind of the punchline that I took away from everything you've just said. The punchline wasn't so much to me that Europeans are disappointed with where America is today. They don't see in, in their, and again and again we heard this phrase, shining city on a hill. That no longer exists in their minds in the same way uh, as it did historically. That to me wasn't the punchline. The punchline to me was the fact that Europeans desperately wanted that America back. So it was this sense, not just that they had lost the America the moral leadership of the America, that America's values had, had not disappeared, but were disappointed, perhaps. But it was actually this sense of, oh, please, where can we refine that America? Which I think is incredibly powerful, that sends a message to me, to American policymakers, that they need to find a way to get that back. Did this come across in any way more so? And I remember, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld who spoke of New Europe and Old Europe. Was this? more pervasive in any part of Europe, or? I, I think it was, um, I mean, it was, it was broadly across Europe, and that's very different, and we can get onto Asia in a second, but a very different sentiment from Asia. Yes, nuances throughout Europe, but, but I would say more broadly, I mean, the, the kind of Eastern Europe, in some sense, remembers it all too fondly. A lot of going back to the Marshall Plan, to World War II, to the sense that America was so altruistic then, now I will, debate that, and where is that today? Um, so I, I think that there is some nuance there, but broadly writ, uh, it's, it's across Europe. The only other thing I would say, and this is again, I'm putting a little footnote to this with my kind of policy hat on, I do wonder again whether, you know, we don't question what those values are. So President Obama was in London in May 2011, which was just literally months after I moved back to London. And he stood in the Houses of Parliament and talked about the mutual values, the common values that the US and the UK hold. Cameron, David Cameron, Cameron comes here and he talks about the common values. What I find interesting about this is nobody talks, what exactly are those values? So we talk about there being a common set of values, but I would, you know, I think we do need to sometimes dig a little bit deeper as to really are they common values? Because to me, there are differences in the nuances. Somebody who's lived on both sides of the Atlantic, who is both British and American, there's interesting disparities there that I think uh, we need to pay attention to. It's like being asked to define a word, and you say, yeah, I know what that word means, and then when you actually have to define it, you're grasping. All right, let's, let's move to Asia then. And um, obviously, one of the, 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 sort of the capstones of the second Obama administration has been the so-called pivot to Asia. Now, of course, pivot to something means pivot away from something else. In this case, I suppose, Europe. So let's keep that idea in the back of the mind. But um, in terms of this, this so-called pivot to Asia, uh, there's also the question of how that was received in, quote, Asia, because Asia is, is an awfully big place. So, for example, was the, the, you know, the rebalancing is another word that's been used. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it appears in the report how the Chinese may view the pivot to Asia, how allies, Japan, Korea, and of course there are tensions among our allies, Japan, South Korea. How do you capture this, this complex picture of the Asian response? So, I mean, you talk to anybody who was in the administration the first term, you know, you talk to Kurt Campbell, who was the Assistant Secretary time. for um, East Asia Pacific, you talk to the folk at the NSC, and they will all kind of sigh and put their head in their hands when you talk about the pivot, and they say, you know, we that was a mistake. Not the strategy. The strategy was the right strategy. The language was the wrong strategy, which is, of course, why they stopped using the word pivot and they started using the word rebalancing, because, of course, as you say, a pivot is towards is a pivot away. Uh, and the intent was to say it's not a pivot away. We can, we can do more than one thing. In my view, and I spent a lot of time working on Asia, and we've done a lot of work separate from this on Asia, uh, the pivot is real. And the pivot continues to be real. Um, what is changing is the pivot is no longer, and in fact never really was a military pivot, which is of course to what this study reflects, what many Asians, Asian allies want to see. They want to see a military pivot. Uh, 
It's not a military pivot. It's a military, diplomatic, economic, norms-building pivot. It is far broader than that, the TPP. This big trade deal between the Pacific partners, principally the US, Japan negotiating at the moment, but many of the Asian states, uh, the US and others, Mexico, Canada, it, this is economic. That's going to be the big uh, Asian policy of this term, assuming we manage to, to pull it off. So the pivot very much is existing. I think that you asked what the Asian states feel about it. Unlike European countries that really focus on America's values, Asian countries are focusing on America's hard power, America's military power. What that means is they look at the pivot and they say, where's the pivot? We don't see more troops, we don't see more ships, we don't see more planes, we don't see a pivot. So, in fact, the pivot has backfired in many respects because America's allies don't see it and they're now asking why is the rhetoric different from the action um, and we don't feel any more secure. In fact, we feel more insecure because now no longer is America reliable because it's saying one thing and it appears to be doing something else, at least in the military scene. At the same time, it's worried China, which they really don't want. You know, so China's saying, wait a second, you're coming into our space. You shouldn't be coming into our space. And so actually, uh, what's happened, because it wasn't well explained, it was the right strategy badly explained, as a result of which you've got a lot of nervous characters in Asia today, which weren't necessarily necessary. What I found interesting was uh, that, that words that came through in the report, in terms of US foreign policy, were unpredictable, unreliable, even hypocritical, all sort of leading towards a sense of uncertainty about American policy. But what also surprised me in the report were some of the statistics, statistics about the popularity of the US in the world, which it was a little counterintuitive. I mean, you hear about single digit approval ratings, and yet you said, you quoted the Pew Global Attitudes Project surveying 39 countries, a median of 63% of all participants held favorable views of the US and, and you know, and it, 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 some of these figures were really quite high. It, it's lowest, obviously, in the sort of greater Middle East. And that. Now, again, I realize this was not a public opinion mm -hmm. survey, but I'm wondering how these uh, sort of rather uh, better than what we might have expected came through in the responses from your elite group. It, mostly the elites and the public overlap. Um, there are exceptions. Values is a, is a place um, where the public, when you talk about American values in Europe, the public will say, actually, we're not that interested in American values. And you have to remember, we were doing this study um, right in the middle or just after the NSA revelations came out, you know, the Snowden revelations. So you can imagine the kind of rhetoric, and I'm sure you all saw the kind of rhetoric that was coming out of the United Kingdom, Germany in particular, France, and others. Uh, so the public don't seem to hold American values with the same high regard, if you will, that the elites do. Um, so there are differences between the elites and the public. Uh, but broadly writ, I mean, you know, your numbers of approvals, I mean, one of the things I find fascinating, no great surprise, Pakistan's approval rating of the United States is in the single digits or very, very low double digits. France, Germany's, oddly enough, less to a lesser degree, the United Kingdom's are in the 70s and 80s. Um, so, I mean, some of the, the results are actually not such a surprise. One of the things that I think it's Pew does an interesting study where they ask three different questions. Uh, what's your views of President Obama and before that President Bush? What's your views of American policy and what's your views of America? And actually, interestingly, you get different answers uh, depending on what, what uh, comes out. One of the things that came out of our study was uh, policy. Of course, lots of people look at America's policy. If you're in Europe or the US, they look at different policies. Interestingly, Europeans, we've long known that foreign policy is domestic policy. For Europeans, domestic policy is foreign policy. When they talk about America being hypocritical, it's, they're talking not just about Guantanamo and Afghanistan and Iraq. They're talking about the death penalty. They're talking about the level of poverty in this country. They're talking about abortion rights, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender rights. I mean, they're, they're talking about Amer American domestic policy and saying, how can you promote this and do this? Whereas if you're in Asia, they don't, they don't care about domestic policy. They're not watching America's domestic policy. They're not even watching, for the main part, America's global policy. They care if you're in Pakistan. They care about what your policy towards Pakistan is and maybe towards India and the border region. So again, very, very different outlooks. And 
the answers to that, or, or, or that's the nuance that you get from this, that if you look at just the raw numbers on Pakistan approval ratings or Germany approval ratings, you don't get into that depth. Mm. Another thing I found arresting was that, uh, as you've just said, it's, it's not just American policy, but America itself and so on. And, and let, let me read a quote uh, from the report. Across the board, elites view US business in a more positive light than they do the US government. Given this, it would be advantageous to the US for its government, wherever possible, to support the ability of these non-state actors to advance US values and expand people-to-people -people links. That's, um, please, please elaborate on that a little bit. Sure, there were two results that were really interesting um, that were less about how people saw America but more about how their views were formed. Uh, one of them is, it's across the board in all of these four sectors, so public sector, private sector, media, and in the think tank, uh, academic communities, all of them, across the board, put American business above everything else. The idea, and, and again, in Asia and in Europe, this idea that American business is so strong, so powerful, something to emulate. And then if you want to take one step, it wasn't just American business, it was American entrepreneurs, American innovation. So really, it's that area, that sector above everything else, everybody can agree upon, is incredibly powerful, uh, and, and as I say, something to emulate, uh, as opposed to the government. That was one result. And so you kind of say, if you're the US government, actually, your diplomats are doing a, sorry to say this, uh, able to do a less effective job at promoting what is respected, what is loved about the United States than maybe American businessmen, and particularly American entrepreneurs. A little controversial. Put but nevertheless. The other thing that was interesting, and this is, is linked to that idea, is that experience in America or in American businesses or with Americans is an incredibly powerful way to affect the way people think. So, you know, again, this has policy implications. Post 9-11, we absolutely restricted our visa regime. Well, you know, my argument is that is the worst thing that we could possibly do, because if actually people's views are made so powerfully by interaction with Americans or in America, then we should be trying to get more and more people coming here. And we should be sending our businesses out so they interact with more and more Americans than they do today. And so there's a couple of things that you just kind of, you look at the results of this and you kind of say, well, I hate to say it, but our policy is working in a way that's antithetical to our interests. Mm. When you say moral leadership is desperately sought from a European perspective, how would the crisis in the Middle East be looked upon from a moral leadership perspective if America acted in the best way possible? Uh, let me give you two answers. The, easier, the easy answer is we are never going to meet the expectations of the world. We just can't. Um, th they cannot be met. Uh, and let me then take a kind of the second answer is, is um, a follow on from that. The challenges, and this is a personal view, the challenges we face today are different from the ones we faced 50 years ago. Uh, there has been a trend, this is not a sudden change, but uh, along with globalization has become interdependence. Uh, we cannot deal with the challenges, if we ever could, we cannot deal with today's challenges unilaterally or bilaterally. You look at the big, big issues, whether it's Ebola, pandemics, it's counterterrorism. These are not things that one state can say, I'm going to deal with it, I'm going to do the X, Y, Z, and I'm going to solve the problem. And so the world is changing. The context in which America acts is changing. America is a necessary but no longer sufficient actor to deal with many of these, of these challenges. And so you can't get a world today, you can't have a world, you can't have an America today that has the ability to stand up alone, if it ever did, and I don't think it did, but I'm, I'm exaggerating to make the point, to stand up alone and be a leader uh, in, in the way that maybe America once was. And so there's, there's this trend to the challenges becoming more interdependent, more complex, necessary but no longer sufficient. And then you do also have this internal challenge which is the social contract under which we've existed for the last 60 odd years no longer adds up. Um, and so there is some changes, are some changes taking place within the United States of saying, 
actually, we have to make different choices. And we do have to make choices that maybe we didn't need to make 60 years ago or 30 years ago. And so the kind of leadership that, that, that the world is looking for, this idea of you know, the, the global policeman that many people say we hate, but yet we want, that's just not viable in today's world. And so you know, the expression I use is, is you know, that awful expression, leading from behind, that was in the, uh, was it the New Yorker um, uh, a year or two, two years ago. Uh, it's leading from within uh, is what we need to be doing now. Uh, and, and I would argue to some extent President Obama is trying to do that. But there is so much uncertainty, there is so much confusion about what America d is doing that that leading from within, if, if that is what's going on, which I argue it is, that leading from within isn't clear. There isn't a clear direction, and that's a real problem because you're then getting these senses of unreliabilities. If you were briefing your former colleagues at the State Department or someone in the White House, what are the key takeaways from a policy perspective? So if you look at the report, the report actually has, I think, eight or nine specific policy recommendations. Um, you know, A, emphasize the corporate sector. Do everything in your power to facilitate their working overseas, gain entry into other, into other countries. That means what, what is going on today, you know, that means TTIP and TPP, you know, two big trade agreements. Everything should be behind those. And I think if I were to argue what is going to be President Obama's focus for the next two years, it's going to be TPP and TTIP for all sorts of reasons. Um, visa regime, we have to rethink our visa, visa regime. I mean, we all know this. It's hugely politically controversial, but it has to be done. Um, understand that domestic policy is foreign policy as far as the Europeans are concerned. That means you actually have to have the secretary of HSS, HHS talking to or you know, DOJ talking to State Department and others. You have to recognize that at the moment there is this uh, understanding of hypocrisy um, because people are watching. You can't anymore think of it entirely domestically. Um, follow through with one of the things that's already happening, which is focus hard power in Asia, soft power in Europe. Um, again, recognize that difference. So, I mean, there are some real policy changes, some of which are just concrete. We need to rethink our visa regime, some of which are more nuanced. Um, how, do you, how do you express yourself? How do you uh, define policies? I mean, one of the things that I always say from when I was at the NSC, I spend a vast amount of my time changing language. As somebody who is half American, half British, Americans will say, we are going to. Brits will say, we will try to. Actually, the Americans and the Brits mean exactly the same thing. We're going to put all of our efforts into doing X. The reality is they come across very, very differently. So, I mean, and I'm not talking about rhetoric. We need to follow rhetoric with action. Um, there's a lot of critique in the Middle East. You know, President Obama did an absolutely fantastic speech in 2009 um, in Egypt. And again, in our, in our results, we heard, and, and the polls suggested as well, you know, great speech, where's the action? Um, so, I mean, there are a number of changes, concrete changes that we can make, some of which are nuanced, some of which are more black and white. What role do you think social media and instant access to the news and what's happening in the world live plays in the perceptions of even elite uh, thought leaders in foreign countries? I don't know whether you saw back in 2000 and. 12, uh, the National Intelligence Council and NIC produced a report called Global, Global Trends 2030. And one of the uh, conclusions that it reached, and it was mirrored by a conclusion that the EU IWS, so the European kind of equivalent, reached, was that uh, about individual empowerment, this idea that the individual was becoming more and more relevant in a way that it hadn't historically been. I thoroughly endorse that. I think that particularly as think tanks, we spend our time focusing on what is the government doing? Um, and we shouldn't be. And one of the things we try and do at Chatham House in the US program is focus on what is the private sector doing? What are the questions they're asking? How are they engaging with the world? What is uh, NGOs? What are NGOs doing? What is civil society doing? In today's world, the, the, the state is hugely important. But I would argue more and more it's the non-state actor who is affecting change. The Gates Foundation is far more influential on education and healthcare in parts of Africa than it is not just the US government, but other governments, African governments. Uh, you know, what are we worried about today? We're worried about IS. 
IS is not a state. Part of the reason that it's so terrifying is it isn't a state. We don't know who to attack. We don't know who is a part of IS. And so this idea of non-states and the media is playing into that because no longer do you have this idea that non-state actors, be they NGOs, individuals, uh, institutions, corporate sector, they have incredible power. Twitter has incredible power. I mean, just date back to, what was it, three or four years ago, 2011, 2012, when the State Department asked Twitter not to shut down for a week or two when they were trying to redo their, reboot themselves. I'm sure that's the wrong expression, apologies. Because actually they were so powerful and such an important player as to what was going on in Tunisia and, and the Middle East. So I think, I think your, your question is an astute one. It's a smart one. We need to figure out how media is changing the way we react. Uh, and we need to start paying attention to all sorts of actors that uh, are not part of our normal way of thinking. I want to thank Xenia particularly because she stopped off in New York solely for this uh, interview. She's winging her way between Washington and Ottawa. So it's with a redoubled uh, sense of obligation and thanks that I ask you to join me in Thank you for stopping in New York. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.